think that's a beautiful point that it's sometimes not easy for us to stay in touch with that. And whether it's with therapy or even just knowing how we work, we constantly have to come back to figuring out how to own ourselves. And it's funny because the book is called How to Own It as a Therapist, but it might as well be called How to Own It as a Person. Welcome to the Permission to Heal podcast. I am Marcy Brockman. Together, we will discover what brings us healing, meaning, and true joy. You only need your own permission to begin. Welcome to Permission to Heal. I am Marcy Brockman, and I am really, honestly, truly glad that you are here for this episode, truthfully for all of the episodes. Um, Today, I have a conversation with Michael Elsie. Um, Dr. Michael Elsie. He is a psychotherapist um, and has a very unique, creative, lovely, enthusiastic way of looking at psychotherapy, looking at therapy, looking at counselors, looking at the whole process of counseling from the client's point of view, from the counselor's point of view, from the supervising counselor's point of view. Um, He has written a book called Therapeutic Improvisation. Therapeutic Improvisation. How to Stop Winging It and Own It as a Therapist. Um, And it's the number one new release on Amazon in psychology education and training. Um, Michael Alsey is a clinical psychologist in private practice in Tarrytown, New York, and mental health educator at the Manhattan School of Music. He specializes in the psychology of artists and everyday creativity and the professional development of therapists. His contributions have appeared in the New York Trib- the Chicago Tribune, the New York Times, NPR, Salon.com, and on the TEDx stage. His book from Norton, entitled Therapeutic Improvisation, How to Stop Winging It and Own It as a Therapist, is currently the number one new release in psychology, education, and training. And uh, we have a really lovely conversation about the interconnection of the metaphor between art and life, between our mind and our body, between our emotions and our intelligence, between what happens in reality and what happens in our minds and what happens on the pages of a book and in the musicality of a symphony and the beauty and the soul transformation of a painting and and how it all melds together um, and how art imitates life and life imitates art and I swear it was a conversation that felt like five minutes and was almost an hour so I really hope that that you enjoy this as much as I do. Um, the links to all things website, social, in media, um, podcast, etc. and his new book are all in the show notes so just scroll down and it will all be there. Remember, you are your most beautiful creation and you should appreciate every single facet of your beautiful, phenomenal self. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, I'm so excited to share with you the new Permission to Heal bookshop on bookshop.org. We all know how important it is to support our local and independent bookshops, and I've created a podcast dedicated bookshop on bookshop.org. So just follow along with me at Permission to Heal Bookshop on bookshop.org. The link will be attached to the post, and you can have access to the entire catalog of books by my expert guests. You can just click and order from the independent bookshops and and support everyone. It's pretty awesome. Um, I've also put a, a bookshelf with my own Permission to Land books on it and all sorts of books for inspirational help and books that I love. So join me on bookshop.org with the bookshop, the Permission to Heal bookshop.
So welcome, um, Michael, Alcee, correct? Yeah. Alcee, Alcee, lovely. You're such a great smile. <laughs> I'm so excited to meet you. I, I, I was just saying before we started recording that uh, I'd seen you a bunch, mul multiple times on LinkedIn and more than once invited you to be on the podcast and have forgotten. So this is just craziness. This life is just insane. <laughs> <laughs> confluence of too many things all at once screws the brain up so i'm so excited to have you here because um i i i'm really intrigued by your new book that i i literally i literally just read the first few pages of but the the what i think is your concept of of developing artistry and using creativity as a way of getting at psychotherapy. And um, as a, an, an English teacher and an artist um, I, and, and a new counseling graduate student, counselor in training, I, I, I feel mm -hmm. like yeah. so much of what I think you talk about is, is just like, I'm your audience. I am your demographic. Yeah. So, yeah, so I mean yeah. Tell us about yourself, your your career, your your you all all the things that are you. Yeah, I mean, what's that's so cool about what you said too is that ironically, I think that therapy, good therapy, comes from literature and the arts actually mm. first. In fact, if you wa if you watch Freud and his development of of his work, it's really starts in narrative. It starts yeah. in in really piecing together narrative and also looking at the gaps in narrative and the symbols in narrative and the thematic material. And I think art is the highest human form we have of connecting to each other and with ourselves. And, and therapy attempts to be as artistic as that on its best days. And so you're right. I, I think there is a real artistry, not only about therapy, but about really being in touch more fully with ourselves. And I see yeah. psychotherapy as the art of teaching art, you know, the art of teaching how we are artful creatures and also how we're scientifically engineered to be artful creatures. And, and in that combination, like we find out, oh my gosh, there's so much that makes sense about how I work and how we work. Mm -hmm. and, and if I can tap into that most fully and express and contain my multitudes to kind of quote Walt Whitman, right? Um, then, then we can not only do something of, of, of wonderfulness for ourselves, but for the world. So I, I, I think there's something really powerful about that. And I think, you know, of course, because psychotherapy had to start in the foot of science, it often needed to prove itself. Sure. Needed and to be yet, something measurable and something repeatable measurable. and replicable yeah. and all of that. Yeah. And yet all the best things are both measurable and immeasurable. And great art is measurable and immeasurable as well. Mm -hmm. Right. If you listen to a great symphony or a great uh, a great jazz piece, it's measurable. We can see what the notes are. We can kind of measure what's going on in time. But the thing that makes it transcendent is that it's immeasurable. Right. You can't quantify what it does to your soul. Yeah. And, you know, psychology comes from the study of the soul psychology. Yeah. Right. So so I think there's something that I was like you you tapping into this correctly, what I was hoping to do with this book was speak to therapists of every stripe and variety and say, wait, let's let's like reimagine what we're doing. Let's get excited about the artistry and the crafts that we do, but let's also look how the science informs that. But it is a creative art That's and awesome. living is a creative art. And our mission is to help people live life creatively and see that this is a great gift that we have, that we share. Yeah, and, and to envelope um, more of the listeners in to this, I think all of this applies to people who would be sitting on the other side of the couch from the therapists, the people who are actually taking taking apart and rebuilding their own psyches with the help of a counselor as yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, the funny thing is I, I wrote it in such a way deliberately to be very accessible because I also want people who are curious about how therapy works and why it works the way it does Sure. To be able to read it just as any therapist would. Mm -hmm. It's written with, I wrote it with, I love film, I love literature, I love poetry, love music. So there's lots of references. I use lots of case examples where you could see how therapy works. And I, I, I really intended it as well as a book that could help people see 
what's what am I looking for in a good therapist? They should have these That's qualities. Huge. Absolutely. Right. And and I think, you know, therapy, we're, we've done a great job at destigmatizing therapy and destigmatizing mental health. But I don't think that people see it as creative and fun and playful and wonderful as it really is. Mm-hmm. And I think it's about more than problems. I think it's about resolving problems, but I think it's about tuning your own instrument and learning how to play it well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know um, when I was writing my memoir, I keyed into books, literature, movies that were transcendental in my in changing my perception of life or changing my perception of myself. And and I kept, you know, writing about that. And and as a teacher, I do that all the time with literature and movies and cross-referencing all sorts of media to try to get at any modality I can to wake a kid up, you know, to illuminate some sort of point. And there was a movie that was so pivotal for me um, called The Holiday. Oh, it's a great movie with uh, Kate Winslet and-, and and Cameron Diaz, right? Yeah. And so there's a moment where Kate Winslet's character is sitting down to dinner with the Hollywood writer, the old man. Yeah. And he looks at her and he's like, "Why aren't you the leading lady in your own life? Why do you keep casting yourself as the best friend?" Yeah. And not only was that an epiphany for her, but that was a huge epiphany for me. Why yeah. did I keep doing that? Yeah. Oh. I know he teaches her gumption, right? He teaches her moxie. It's great. great. And that's what I mean. And that's the other thing is like, talk about Marcy, the beautiful, like that beautiful epiphany when we're like, wait a minute, I deserve to own myself. Right. I've been here all along waiting for me to own myself, but not to be selfish, but to be more of what I can share with the world and, and give to the world. That's what being, being, being creative is not about being selfish. Being creative is about giving to the world it's from your- It's compassion, it's empathy. It's, yeah. yeah, it's everything. And so I think that's a beautiful point that it's sometimes not easy for us to stay in touch with that. And whether it's with therapy or even just knowing how we work, we constantly have to come back to figuring out how to own ourselves. And it's funny because the book is called How to Own It as a Therapist, but it might as well right. be called How to Own It as a Person. Right. Right. And it comes back to my whole concept of permission to heal. You know, yeah. I, I figured out at some point in my early to mid 40s that in order to live the life that I wanted to live, the life that I secretly in my head, in my heart, knew that I had within me to create for myself, I had to stop looking externally for me, from mm-hmm. me, for the permission to do that. I had to actually dig deep inside myself because the the impetus, the permission, the whole the whole push to do it was already here inside me. Yeah. I just needed to give her voice and let her shine and do her thing. And well, that's beautiful. And you know, it reminds me a lot of uh, Rilke, right? In his letters to a young poet, he really tells the aspiring young poet that it's really an inside job. It's really yeah. kind of going off and really listening and really asking the questions and really kind of trusting and having faith in what your art is going to come through you. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's sort of like a meditative practice that we need to be in touch with. But I love your idea of permission to heal. Sometimes I think we, instead of getting permission, we get criticism for our experience. Sometimes right. it's even self-criticism for our experience. But permission is such a beautiful thing because permission allows us to play and we need to play even with our grief, even with our hurt. Yeah. In fact, the best therapy, by the way, it's obviously the best therapy helps us bring out our strengths and it helps us kind of connect to who we are. But the best therapy allows us permission to be our most vulnerable and our most wounded in, in ultimate safety and also ultimate support and encouragement. Absolutely. And that is what I, what I have gotten from the therapist I've been seeing for over a decade and what I hope to give to my eventual clients and what I know that I provide for my students, which has sort of got me to this new path. 
And it makes me think of something else too, Marcy. I was thinking about you as a teacher and you as a, a therapist in training. Sure. The funny thing is I think actually the best English teachers are the best therapists in a way because they're dealing with the range and scope of the human condition. Right, right. And I also think the best therapists are the greatest teachers. So it's important to be a teacher because a teacher is constantly learning from their mm -hmm. students and constantly trying to figure out how to transmit something that they've done a hundred times in a new way, right. both for the delight of the student, but also the delight of themselves. Yeah. And therapy... I start the school year each year with an article that talks about how good literature is actually a lesson in emotional intelligence. It's completely, it's completely. Yeah. And it's, it's also, uh, you know, it's something that like, you know, as you know, it's like you see so many different facets of it throughout your life. Like I read To Kill a Mockingbird again last year over the pandemic. Right. And I read The Great Gatsby again. And it was just so fascinating to see these different elements that I didn't tap into when I was in high school reading it. Of course it. not. You don't have the life experience behind you to, to figure no. out why does Jay Gatsby want to reclaim the past? Why does he think yeah. he can? And, and why does Jay Gatsby, right, like need to make himself into this other thing? And it, isn't that glamorous? And isn't it also poignantly sad too? So sad. And isn't it like this interesting ambivalent commentary on the American dream and the American nightmare, right? A at the same time, it's, it's so fascinating. Um, and then I was thinking something else as you were talking, like this, the way we connect literature to life. I have a four-year-old son. And the other day he did something that was so cute. He, we were putting on the hose with a sprayer mm -hmm. and it started to leak. And I said, it's okay, bud, because ah, here's the washer. I just got to put the washer in. And he's like, just like the man with the yellow hat. He did <laughs> that for the sink. Only it wasn't the hose, it was the sink. And I just, wow. the reason I love it is because I think we're built to make connections between yeah. life and art and that art informs life and life informs art yes it's cyclical and never ending there's no end there's no beginning yeah and i thought that it was beautiful that he's internalized the man with the yellow hat as a teacher gotta love curious george love curious george by the way curious george you know it was started by two german Im jewish immigrants who were fleeing they were the ones who wrote it. They changed their name so that it didn't sound as German at the time because they were anti-German sentiment. Huh. They were the ones who came up with Curious George. Interesting. There's this totally interesting backstory and it just makes you, It's just, I, I love that when you find out all these different layers of things. And that's the other thing that I sure. think is wonderful about therapy is that it's, it's, it delights in the layers. It delights in the complexity and the nuance, mm -hmm. just like poetry delights in multiple meaning, right? Like the thing that makes poetry move, the thing that makes poetry so rich is that Robert Frost said, you know, metaphor allows you to say one thing and mean another. Right. And so it allows you to do these acrobatic things that you can't do with ordinary language. And yet is exactly what experience is about. It is. It is. So many times we think that we're going through our, our forward moving timeline with, with a specific goal in mind or a specific thought in mind. And really what's going on is other layers above and below that or adjacent yes. to it. You know, I, I, after my mom died in 2013 um, from opiate addiction of all things, um, I, I had like a, a sort of long protracted grieving period and uh, I don't even know how to articulate what I'm trying to say, but um, in order to eulogize her just two days after she died, um, I went through 70, 80 years of photographs that, that I happened to be the keeper of the photographs. And I had to figure out how do I, how do I separate myself from the disappointed daughter who feels abandoned, who's grieving over the mother-daughter relationship she was she's never going to have um and figure out how to separate that and the anger and be able to eulogize her lovingly and respectfully and appropriately and and i instinctively went back to the photographs so that i could see her as the multi-layered onion that she was 
you yeah. know, and see her as the loving, doted on little baby girl and, and as a little kid and as a teenager and see her as a young adult and see her with me when I was a baby. And, and I started to see all these photographs and realize and remember the good and the loving and the generous and the empathetic and, and all those other aspects of her that the, the drug addicted version of her at the end sort of crowded out. Yeah, I mean, I think you bring up a beautiful point that it's it's sometimes hard to stay with that universe that is the other person, mm -hmm. the many different kind of facets of all of them. Right. But it, I, I think Louise Erdrich said something interesting. It's it's very very difficult to sort of love or know somebody, but our job is to keep on trying, essentially. Yeah. And and I think that was a beautiful act of of love and, and grace in, in sharing that. At the same time, you know, the other thing that's really fascinating about being human that your story brings up is that I think grief is the highest form of love in its own way too. Because grief shares how important the person was both in who they were and who we wish they could be. Which that's true, if you don't care about them, you're not gonna grieve. You're much. not gonna grieve. So, so I think there's something really sophisticated about this human capacity to grieve and how challenging it is, but also how important and necessary it is. And I think grief teaches us about how wonderfully complex and nuanced we are. Yes. Uh, I think grief is something that is, is actually, I think poetry runs on grief because poetry is about showing how much we love, but how much we know we're going to lose. Is that why I can only write poetry when I'm sad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, completely. And poetry is built so that the line breaks in to show us that we're all contending with the finality of life. And yet mm -hmm. we're trying to use that tension to create something in the enjambment that's beautiful. Wow. Right. Right. Everything that you say is so profound, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm talking to a literary person. It's not hard, right? So that's that's the cool thing about, I, I think, exactly what you're tapping into. That, And this is actually something obviously this is relevant to our time today is it's very easy for us to become polarized and become one dimensional or two dimensional, but it behooves all of us to always seek out this third dimension and always seek out looking at things, even in the people we think we hate or disagree with. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think also therapy is trying to teach us too, that we're trying to love others, even for the sides that we think we hate and love ourselves for the sides that we think are hate. If, you, if we extend your permission to heal, permission to heal is not just about us, it's about permission to heal others and right. start to imagine the lovable, hurt, beautiful sides of them that sometimes get eclipsed by all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah. When I, when I come across, and it happens every year, a particularly annoying pain in the ass student who I just want to throttle on a daily basis, I force myself to imagine him or her as an infant. Right. In his or her mother's arms, you know, being swaddled and suckled and, and cozied and adored. And it always helps me find the empathy and the humanity I need to come up with the compassion necessary to reach that child. It's amazing. And I think being a teacher and being a therapist helps us to cultivate more deeply that that empathy. Because when you're kind of trying to figure out, wait, why is this student having a difficult time? Or why is their behavior like this? There's something else going on. Right. I can't well, just look at what's going on in the classroom. I have to look at the whole kid's life. What? Yeah. There's got to be stuff that's going on there. You've got to play detective, but you've got to play emotional detective, right? And, right. And, and, and I think that's the beauty of it. But the more that we do that, and you'll see this as you do therapy more and more, like that's the, that's the beauty of it. That's what our payoff is. We get, obviously, we're, yeah. yeah, the psychic income we get from it is also like really appreciating how much more there is to people than we realize sort of like you know how like they just discovered like with this new telescope they see all these interesting galaxies oh my god gorgeous photographs gorgeous. that make hubble look like you know yeah preschool well, drawings preschools yeah so the beauty of, of i never thought of this connection until now this is what i love about riffing together sure is that therapy allows us to 
as therapists and as clients to see with that kind of richness, these other galaxies that we didn't even know were attainable and insight. Right. And the more that we do it, the more we get these beautifully sharp pictures of what's out there. Obviously it's what's in there paradoxically, but it's as beautiful oh, wow. as what's out there. And it's as magnificent and it's as enormous. The psyche is enormous even though we can't see it. It's its own universe. Yeah. And, and the way we're built is so rich, so complex, but so beautiful. And, and to me, it is like those galaxies, those beautiful galaxies that we see. So, so what do you think of the, the, uh, the aphorism that's going around social media now that we are not what our thoughts are? That you are not your thoughts. What, <laughs> yeah. I, I am having a really hard time reconciling this. To me, it yeah. seems to be sort of asking for dissociative pathology. You know, like yeah. I am not. How can I separate myself from that? Yeah, I think so. I think in part it has some wisdom, and in part it's it's wrong. <laughs> so the part that is wrong, I'll start with that, is that okay. we are actually not just our thoughts. Descartes was wrong. It's not that we think, therefore we are. We feel, therefore we are as well. Right. And I heard someone say that we are not thinking beings who feel sometimes, we're actually feeling beings who think sometimes. Exactly. And it turns out that if you look at it, even the neuroscience of it, in the book, I talk about this as well. Like the neuroscience of it is that our, our feeling sides, our right brain freewheeling associative sides, our nonlinear sides, our more body centered sides are online first. It's only later that these more left brain logical kind of sides where we and that says something to me that is actually more important for us to be developed with this other side first so antonio a lot of it that way yeah, yeah that's and, true as babies we're before we're, we're you know pre-linguistic we're experiencing why we, everything why we with our bodies right? right if it was so important to have the then we'd have that first but the problem with that is that limits us too, because notice logic also makes sometimes us say, no, I shouldn't do that because that's not okay. But feeling is much more rich in that way. And Antonio Damasio is a great neuroscientist who's written lots about it. And, and he says that we've neglected and relegated feeling as secondary, where it's actually just as important. It's an equal partner as thought. So, right. so that's to, to answer your question. It's, it's yes, sometimes our thoughts just like with meditation, sometimes it's important to be able to observe them and not get completely over-identified with them, right? That's helpful. But we also want to look for what kind of information they're giving us. And also just, we can't necessarily just say, oh, those are just thoughts and I can tune that out. That's, that is dissociative. Mm -hmm. um, we also want to do like Susan David writes a lot about this, this idea of emotional agility, which is we want to kind of also understand what we're thinking or what we're feeling so that we can use that to, to deepen an understanding of what's going on inside. For, for the people who are more logical, it's data. For the people who are more feeling oriented like myself, it's music that we need to listen to. Mm -hmm. So it's it's helpful to be able to say I'm not just my thoughts, but that doesn't mean that, you know, if I'm having a thought about something, it means that it's just noise. Right. Sometimes we're having a thought for a very good reason. And sometimes ah, there's just that critic again. Now, why is that critic coming up? Oh, wait, because I, this is the internalized critic that I got from my mother or my father or my teacher or my friends. Or why is this coming up? Because I'm actually making creative progress and there's a part of my psyche that's scared of that progress. And so now it's trying to hold me back. Right. There's always more to the it's story. A myriad of reasons, yeah. So there's myriad reasons. And of course we know like what Pascal said, right? Like the, the heart has reasons for which the mind knows not. So it's important to kind of remember that, yes, this idea of the cognitive behavioral theorists, which is useful, right? That we're not only our thoughts is fine but it's we're not official i think it's it doesn't very get superficial. at the heart of really the foundation of what's on the underpinnings of that well it's interesting too there's a new theory a newish theory called polyvagal theory you might have heard of it yes. so it's really interesting because they talk about how we've evolved and um the thing is more of the nerves go from our body to our brain than from our brain back to our body 
So when we discount our feelings and say only our thoughts are important, we're like neglecting 80% of ourselves. That's silly, right? Yeah, that's right. So, profound. Yeah, so, so in other words, if we were built this way, we were built in this really intricate and, and important way to have a very discriminating mind. Mm -hmm. And it is important for us to determine what's noise and what's real. That's important. And again, that's what a good musician does. They don't just say, ooh, there's dissonance. That's not interesting. They say, oh, there's dissonance. This could be interesting. Right. And it doesn't mean that it's only going to be dissonance. So it does, it's not, it, I would say instead of saying, um, what was the, what was the phrase? Like, you're not your thoughts or something like that. Yeah. You might not be your thoughts, but it's not bad to entertain the, your thoughts and give them room to be and to investigate. They may not be, they may be, they may have partial truths. Right. They may be indicative of something else that you're trying to deal with and they, or they. And there might be feelings under the hood of your thoughts that will help you get a fuller picture of why you're thinking those things. That's true. In other words, we tend to split off thoughts and feelings. We're a very kind of black and white culture. We tend to split off these things in terms of red state, blue state, things like that. And <laughs> we do it very easily because it's simple and it's helpful. But I think I wrote something in the book, like instead of I think for, for I am, it should be, I, I wrote, I can't even remember what I wrote, but it was something like the effect of, I think, I, I, I feel that I think I am, even though I feel things that I know not of right? It's, right. it's so much more nuanced and interconnected than that. And we actually do ourselves a disservice to oversimplify ourselves, right? Yeah, I, I think even, I think we all have very complicated inner lives that, that would be very uh, lengthy, uh, for lack of a better word, to unravel. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and you're right. And you're right. It's, it's, we want to take the wisdom out of it without losing the goodness, right? And the goodness is the Dalai Lama is totally on it, right? Like, it's true. Being able to stand aside from your thoughts is helpful. But then you also want to kind of notice them and get, get to figure out what they're trying to tell us. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that, we're not, that's what the Buddhists, I think, are saying. It's not getting overly attached to thoughts and thinking this is just me, right? It's also like, instead of saying, um, uh, you could say I feel angry rather than I am angry. Right. Because because it gives That's you more accurate. That gives you a little bit more distance that your feeling is all of you, and it doesn't all of a, all of a sudden make you think that you are just this thing. That's again more nuanced, and that allows us not to take on our thoughts as just it. I'm feeling angry, or I'm thinking about this in this negative way. That's not all I am. So I think it really comes back to that's not all I am. And I think it's hard for us to stay with that ambiguity. You know, as English people, we know we love that ambiguity. Sure. But sometimes it's not so easy to stay with that ambiguity. But, you know, the poet- but it gives you room to then dive into it. You know, oh, if completely. I say I'm really freaking angry right now, there's no room to dissect that. But if I'm there's aware no of the fact that I'm angry and I say, okay, I'm feeling very angry now, I think I'm automatically allowing space to to analyze where that's coming from and what that means you're right and to kind of riff on your idea of permission to heal the more that we've had permission from caretakers parents teachers friends to in, explore that and be curious about that and to be intrigued by that rather than put off by that or worried that this is going to be a problem or this is going to make things worse the more that we have permission from our supports the more we cultivate this. And the funny thing, like I've talked about in the book, but in general is that the paradox of being human is that we can't do it alone. It's the rub of it too. We wish we could. We need each other to kind of help bring these qualities online. Yeah. And, yeah. and so this permission to heal that you're talking about is permission to help others to heal as well by affording them the space of being able to say, I welcome this side of you even though it might be difficult for you, even though it might even be difficult for me. Yeah. But if there's it more wasn't here. For three phenomenal therapists, I wouldn't have been able to get out of my own way. I I yeah. grew up as an only child in a family where it where I did not feel safe 
to express myself. I did not feel safe to actually acknowledge that I had needs and wants that were not being met. You yeah. know, my mom was just too dangerous to express that stuff to, you know, and I, I hid it literally in my closet too many times than I could have cared to count. And I remember at one point she was aware enough to realize that at like 15 or 16 that I really did need a counselor. Mm -hmm. But she was narcissistic or stupid enough to not realize that she needed to not be in the room. Yeah. And, the, and the counselor who was seeing me should have had her license revoked or been bitch slapped by her supervisor because she didn't insist that my mother leave. She yeah. asked me in front of my mother, well, do you want space to yourself with me alone? Or do you want you, you know, is it okay if your mother stays? And it wasn't even safe for me to say, I want my mother to go so that I can talk to you without her. Yeah. And, and so ultimately what the therapist then resolved was that I wasn't ready to talk. No, I was more than ready to talk. I yeah. just needed someone else to be smart enough or, or compassionate enough to know that they needed to create the space for me because yeah. I couldn't get it myself. Yeah, I mean, we need that space and we need to have it protected. I mean, Winnicott talks about it as being the holding environment. The holding environment is beautiful. And the other thing I wanted to share with you too, Marcy, which I, I love about you know your story here too, is that sometimes many of us, many of us, I'd say almost you know so many people, including myself, is that we didn't always have the ideal family circumstances, right? No. Or or we did have these emotionally neglectful or even abusive people, or or really disconnected or emotionally underintelligent people in our lives. Um, I think sometimes art can save us too, because art also reminds us that we're not alone in wrestling with the slings and arrows of what it is to be alive. And, and the characters in literature and the characters in movie remind us that there's more to this thing yeah, and yeah. that we have all of human history to support us. Like there's a, there's a beautiful moment in Goodwill Hunting, I think, when, such you know, fabulous movie. such a great movie. And I think Rob Williams like asks like, uh, Matt Damon's character like you know who his friends are and he's like yeah William Shakespeare right, and right. you know all these different people because and I think that's important for us to see how art can also help to bolster us and support us no matter what our circumstances are you know like today is Nelson Mandela's birthday right happy birthday Mandela okay yeah and I think of somebody also who was in prison for so many years but the reason that I think he did so beautifully not only because he was such a man a man of such integrity and such character, but he also had very, very deep correspondences with his wife and other people, and they sustained him. They helped him to stay human and to stay mm -hmm. compassionate. And when he came out, he was a changed man, but for the better in terms of he was even gracious with those who were his captors. Yeah. And, and, and to, to kind of come to that kind of inner journey takes a sort of inner fortitude that's recognizing that there's something bigger that we can tap into. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of not only res resilience, but also that resourcefulness and that courage, that inner courage and that capacity to keep hope alive in knowing that there's more. And I think there's something about art that is beautiful, that art teaches us that there's always something more, right? Yeah. William yeah. James, William and, James. And that we should have the patience to find it and look for yes. it. Yes, yes. And I think that's the patience to find it and look for it. And that's where the safety comes, right? Helps mm -hmm. us to do that. But the more artists, what I think artists are so, the reason that they're such emotional risk takers is because they've learned how to trust the process mm -hmm. of going for it, not in some cavalier conventional way, but I mean of really allowing themselves to open up more deeply into the psyche. You know, like, you know, like how Leonard Cohen would allow himself to go deeper into the psyche to say, wait, right. what's more in this, in this song, Hallelujah? This right. isn't just about David being a king. This is about David, like, lamenting how difficult it is to praise the God who you disappoint, that disappoints you, where you also realize that this whole thing of living and loving is not as easy as you think it is. No. And no. yet it's beautiful, but it's also broken. 
And beautiful in the brokenness. And beautiful in the broken. And that's what, and I think that kind of texture, that kind of richness is what art allows us. But I think also really being in touch with the psyche allows us if we really kind of listen to all that the psyche has to offer. Right. And I don't think it's, it's also, I mean, at least for me, it isn't just the enjoyment of or the the inhalation of other people's art but it's the creation of the art itself that i find oh yeah yeah even if i'm not planning on sharing it with anybody just sitting here you know taking my computer this is a drafting table that i have my computer on you know I, I i retrofitted my art studio to be the recording studio for the podcast and and I'm surrounded by discarded paintings, truth be told, everywhere I look. Yeah. Um, but it's it's the act of painting for my own benefit that really taught me to have empathy and compassion for myself, that taught me resilience and patience and and where I came up with this notion of giving myself permission to live the life that I wanted to live to create this for myself and for my kids. And um, yeah, I want to quote, I want to quote you on something here. This is, this is a great, this is a great, great, great Bradbury quote. Okay. On, on the importance of art, on, on the importance of why it is that we do it. And it comes from an interesting, different angle than you'd expect. It's not okay. the, it doesn't seem like it's an inspiring one, but it really is because all of this is so essential to who we are. So he writes, if you did not write every day, the poisons would accumulate and you would begin to die or act crazy or both. You must stay drunk on writing so reality cannot destroy you. So art, hel- art exactly, art <laughs> helps us to stay connected to how imagination can keep the magic in life and help us to illuminate the real. Mm-hmm. But it does so in a way that allows us possibilities again even in the most difficult stuff right and so i think of art as something as extraordinary and i think that's what therapy can be too is an art in itself because on its best days it allows us to do that right it allows us to both express and contain and explore all that's within us all that's outside of us and all that's between us That's very profound. Right? <laughs> yeah, but in the 18 months prior to my mother's death, um, we weren't speaking, mm-hmm. my choice, because she was too toxic. I had to protect myself and my kids from the monster that the addiction had created her into. Yeah. And during that time, I kept writing short stories about my mother's death. I kept creating characters out of her and characters out of me and different scenarios for how this particular daughter was going to lose that particular mother. Yeah. And I didn't realize until afterwards, because who the hell knows what you're doing at the time, um, that what I was doing was trying to figure out our relationship and how I felt, obviously, and, and, and prepare myself for the my mother's eventual death and i remember this one particular version of the story that i was i was quite pleased with and i showed my therapist and she read it and she's like well you're done you've graduated <laughs> you know yeah exactly you you figured it out so you know amen yeah to you. <laughs> it's amazing i mean i think that's the other thing i think you know like you said too making art also helps us to is 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 really therapeutic in 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 these important ways i think the best art is therapeutic and i think the best therapy is artistic you know i mean right i i think that's why we're moved by art is because it hits us deep in the psyche right yeah we you see know? what other characters for me it's always a novel or a play i i find the most connect the most connective tissue yeah. But but you you know you see what motivates a character and why a character becomes the person that he or she has become. Yeah. 
and and it illuminates the human condition it illuminates i mean that sounds totally cliche i sorry about no, that but it does but it does i mean that's what it does i mean it, it really it really does and it allows us to explore you know so much more territory right like i think that's the other thing to kind of you know use another metaphor it, it like allows us to traverse so much more territory than we realize is there and in fact we even discover new territory that we thought we already knew and, and it, gives, it gives, I think, the therapist and the client a safe, metaphoric um, soccer pitch to, yeah, to, to yeah. play on. You know? Yeah, it's, it's totally good. I mean, you know, I wrote on this in the book. Uh, Robert Frost said, those who aren't well educated in the metaphor aren't safe to be let loose in the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. And I think that, you know, therapy as in life is, is the art of learning how to use metaphors to help us to imagine what's both similar and different in every experience we have. Because what does metaphor do, right? Metaphor literally comes from Latin to carry over. It's right. the bridge between two, different, two disparate things. Disparate things, but disparate things that also find commonality, which is, by the way, isn't it funny? I never thought about this either, Marcy. Relationships, like any relationship is a metaphor because we're trying to connect two, two people, two disparate things in a way that has common ground. Right. A relationship is the ultimate metaphor, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so we need to understand how metaphors work, right? So there was a great scene in um, the book, The Fault in Our Stars. Um, that it was that in, book cost so, me like six boxes of tissues. It's so, so I beautiful. I think I was dehydrated from tears. Oh, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was so good. And in the movie, it was great too. Like she's, she's meeting Augustus this character at the cancer support group, for those who don't know it, she's a young girl in high school who has cancer. She's met this attractive, charismatic guy and they're shooting the breeze together outside and everything's going really well. He's flirting with her, she's flirting with him. And all of a sudden he pulls out this cigarette and he puts it in his lips, between his lips and she is totally disgusted. Mm -hmm. And he says, why are you disgusted? I don't smoke, this is just a metaphor. Put the thing that tries to kill you in between your own lips. Right. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. And it's the power of metaphor is so important. I think also because as a culture, we literalize way too much. Yeah. You know? And, and so I think metaphor allows us to keep the dimension, to keep the bridges, the bridges open. What more do we need? And the inclusivity and the diversity of life. Yeah. You know? And what it does is it allows us to have ambivalence and complexity and dissonance, but without losing connection. Mm -hmm. Like if we could have more metaphor in our politics, that would be helpful, right? In terms of building bridges between people and saying, okay, we don't think exactly, but what's our common ground, even though we're disparate? Right. Right. And there'd be a lot more than that than I think we are aware that is there. But I think what we sometimes, we sometimes can also, I think also some of our technology helps us get better at this. Some of our technology helps us flatten this stuff, right? Like we can use these technologies, like all the stuff that we have to try to flatten and obliterate people and other them or, you know, cut off the connections on those bridges. Right. And it's, it's really to all of our detriment in that way. And I think that's what literature helps us to do. Atticus Finch helps us to see in a strange way that even the people who he is fighting against, he has empathy for. Yeah. That is extraordinary what Absolutely. he does, right? Absolutely. And for many years, he was my guidepost. Me too. I would, I would ask myself, okay, what would Atticus Finch do in this situation? Exactly. And, and I always made the right choice that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think that's that's it. And Atticus also is someone who really works from the inside out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think he's the uh, unsung introvert of the 20th century. Hell you know, yeah. but I mean, I think I think you're right. I think that's something that is so so important. And I think that's what I was trying to show in the book too of how beautiful that process is, and how therapy helps us to tap into that more fully. So so where did how how are you? How, how are you getting that across to the therapists that you're writing to in the book? You mean, how am I getting it across that, that. Yeah. 
the, all this stuff. So, you know, I really, I'm trying, I'm tr really on a mission to help therapists see what many of us feel, which is that this is an art and that we are, there's an artfulness to it, but there's an artfulness that we're teaching the people we work with and we should own it more, you know, like own it in a way of like, I mean, I find therapy so much more fun as a therapist because I feel like, oh my God, I'm creating such great literature here. Or, this is an interesting movement in the symphony today. Right. right. And when you come out of that, you don't just feel like you're an all day listener or receptacle, right? You're a creator too. You're a creator. And I always think of how does this inspire me in my personal life? How does it inspire me in terms of my writing or inspire me in terms of falling in love more with the world? And that kind of mindset, I think, is something that we don't talk about enough as therapists. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's actually better than the, oh, look at us therapists, we're destigmatizing mental health. That's great. But to me, that's not poetic at all. And it may be necessary to get people in the seats, but it's totally necessary. But you know what? When you want someone to have a piece of art, you also want them to get excited about being enchanted. And I oh, think, of course. and I think as therapists, I think we also should be enchanted with the beauty of our crafts, but the beauty of this art, this life, right? So now the trick for me is going to be when I finish all my coursework to find a supervising, <laughs> supervising situation for my field work that, that is like this. <laughs> It's, it's, I mean, that's the other thing I wrote it for. I wrote it for trainees who didn't have that supervisor mm -hmm. so that they could feel companioned and to feel like these aspects of themselves as people and as therapists are supported. And also I wrote it for supervisors to say, bring this into your supervision. This is what it's all about. This is, this is, so for me, this has been not only an ars poetica, right? A way of saying why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. a way of saying this is why we do what we do Beautiful. and and I hope that in some small way it could help add to that you know um I I once uh, in the book I talk about meeting uh, I was at a psychotherapy networker conference and they were giving master clinician Irvin Yalm a lifetime achievement award and I raised my hand and, and thanked him but basically said you know I think you've taught us all as therapists how to be artists and wow. I, I went into why, and he, he didn't believe me that he was an artist. And Sue Johnson, who was moderating this talk, tried to convince him, and I emailed him, and I explained to him what I meant more, and he's like, I get it now. And I was like, wow. You taught him something. I taught him something, but I was hoping that maybe we can teach each other something. Sure. Because I think this can expand what we do as therapists and 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 also help the world wow. right <laughs> yeah so you know i mean if, if it does something like that would be great but that that was that was the intention okay well i i think i think you're successful plus there's oh. also there's also great films in there i, I do quote goodwill hunting and little nice. miss sunshine and joy and all sorts I mean, that's of, what films are. There's you know? such good films in They're there. Lessons on how to live and how not to live your life, on how to build and destroy relationships. They're completely. They're... And and also and also just to see, you know, I I also quote Shakespeare, like Lord, like what fools these mortals be? We are all foolish in all of this stuff, and it's 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 important to also recognize how foolish we are despite ourselves and how we're built to be foolish. And that's not a, def that's not a deficit. It's part of how we're made. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that is something really, really important because I think we sometimes feel like, oh, I should be all figured out or I should be all this. And no, I mean, no. and that's what you said about the process. And the other thing about being an artist is you start to relish the process, not just the product. Well, the process is everything. The process I, is everything. I, yeah. I, I lose interest in, in, a, in a, a drawing or a painting the minute I'm, I think I'm finished with it. The minute it stops speaking to me and I, I think it's done, oh, yeah. I'm not interested in it anymore. I'm yeah, only exactly. focused and really interested while it's in process. And then I don't know what the hell to do with it. Well, then we move to the process of something else, right? Right. So, so I just keep moving on and on and on, which is why yeah. I'm in a room filled with art I don't know what to do with. 
Right. But again, I think that's the beauty of it. I think because because life is like that and art is like life, right? And life is always seeking to move to what next in a in a healthy way, right? William James, the great psychologist, said the capacity of a soul is wanting more. Yeah. You know? I'll take that. Absolutely. I want more. I always want more. That's what keeps me what's what keeps me sustained, is what keeps me going. Exactly. There's always another project. There's always another thing to do. There's always something else to create. There's always someone else to have an activity with. There's always something else to learn. I, I don't understand people and if I offend anyone who's listening, I apologize. But I don't understand people who say they're bored. Well, I think it's because when you have this capacity to enjoy the process and and see what's new and what's familiar, right? All of a sudden, infinity is always at your feet. Yeah, there's always there's, something to do there's, or think about or create or something. There's no way to be bored if infinity is at your feet. Kafka said something to that effect too. And remember, Kafka like hardly left, you know, Prague, right? But <laughs> he didn't need to leave Prague because he had it all coming inside of him. And I think you're right. And that's why cultivating this sense allows us to stay in touch with the perpetual magic of living and the world. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a completely renewable resource. Yeah. It's, there's always more of it. Just have to look outside of yourself and be open to seeing what's actually there. Yeah. And get and to figure out where the blockages are that sometimes keep you from tapping into it, right? The great artists also know how to work with writer's block and know how to work with when, you know, the muse dries up. They, they learn how to fill the well again. That is the perpetual job of all of us. For me, it's changing modalities. If I'm, yeah. if I'm blocked up on a painting, I'll go watch but, a movie or exactly. I'll walk or I'll have some coffee or I'll have sex or I'll take a nap or yeah. you know, I'll do something else. And then, and then when it calls to me again, I go back to it, but. Um, that's right, that's right. And that's, and that's you know. exactly it too. And I think you bring up a good point too that variety is really important for us psychologically. And sometimes riffing off of somebody else, you know, like if I'm stuck with something, you know, I mean, it could be, it could be something academic too. I was writing a paper last night and I was stuck and I couldn't figure out the, the conclusion. And I happened to be doing a virtual like this zoom class with the professor. No one else showed up. It was supposed to be for the whole class. No one else showed up. So I had like a 60 minute one-on-one with her and I talked through the whole thing and realized what the conclusion was. There it is. And all she did was listen. She didn't give me an answer. She right. just said, okay, and what else do you know? Yeah. That was, that was her only question. And, yeah. and I figured it out, but I, I do the same thing with characters. I do the same thing. You know, I think that all artists figure out a way to do that for themselves. Exactly. I think so too. And I think you get better at learning which way works for you at what time. Yeah. And that's what I think therapy helps you do too, is to learn which, which part of myself is operating right now and what does it need and why, mm-hmm. and how do I, how do I give that to them? And how do I keep on figuring out which which me I'm dealing with right now? And clear out the extra minutia that gets yeah. in the way. Completely. Completely. Yeah. Totally. All of that stuff. Yeah. Oh, so exciting. Yeah, this has been great. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. pleasure. My pleasure. So we'll do the seven quick questions on our way out. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So what six words would you use to describe yourself? Ah. That's cool. Um, passionate, cool. Um, uh, you know, creative, mm-hmm. um, reflective, mm-hmm. Um, warm, yeah. uh, mischievous. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that in the smile for sure. <laughs> um, curious, insatiable. Wow. Perfect words, Michael. Perfect yeah. words. Um, what is your favorite way to spend a day? Oh, favorite way is mixing it up between being on my own and being with people. I'm a total ambivert. So my perfect day is having a walking session with somebody, then going home and playing piano or writing, playing with my four-year-old, going back and forth between high octane and low octane, you know, 
But of course, and, and if I had my ideal day, that would include going to the beach. <laughs> okay. I'm one of those weird people who like the beach off season. I don't like to go when it's warm. It's beautiful. it's beautiful off season. I don't want to go when it's hot. I don't want to go when there are a lot of people there. I go in the winter when there's no one else there. It's beautiful off season. I, I'm all for it off season. Ugh. Any season, I'm all for it. It's just too, If I'm going to be sweating on the sand, I don't want anything to do with it. Um, okay. What is your favorite childhood memory? Oh, my gosh. Wow. That's a good one. Uh, you know, my mom and I, my mom was a social worker, but she was also a student of literature. And on Friday nights on Shabbat in the Jewish religion, we would have what we'd call our fireside chats. Okay, and so okay. we eat dinner together and then we just talk and have these talks about what we were reading and stuff going on. That's and beautiful. it was just like, we'd call it our fireside chats and, and just that like throughout my throughout my childhood and my young adulthood it was it wasn't every week but it was certainly it was something that we carried through that's beautiful i used to have dinner i was a single mom it was just me and my kids and i, I we used to sit at the table and we you know say the blessing and and have our dinner and mm -hmm. it was always conversations like that and then they became teenagers and had different schedules and teams and jobs and the that sort of connected family dinner sort of disappeared and yeah it's wild right but but i mean that was the one that instantly came up to me even though i know i'm a little beautiful. older than a child but it it's to me is beautiful I the love warmth that. of we we call it our fireside chats that's great that's great um what is your favorite meal oh okay this is a good one believe it or not i like blackened cajun chicken there's something about the spiciness that i like mm. So when I went to William, I went to Williams College and there was this great little restaurant called Hobson's Choice and they had this blackened Cajun chicken, which was just the right level of spice. Lovely. And and then they had this mud pie for dessert. Oh. So it was like, and it had a little maple syrup on it. So you had the spicy and then for dessert, you had the sweet. Nice. Perfect. Nice. I used to love hot and spicy Cajun anything, but things change. <laughs> can't do it anymore stomach says no yeah um okay what's one piece of advice you would like to give your younger self oh yeah um trust your instincts more your intuition is is much better than you think it is uh really really it took me uh until my for my 40s to really trust my instinct more <laughs> you know but, you know, Jung said, you know, you're, you know, you're only doing research until 40, right? Uh, you know, that's when life starts. Right. That's where it starts anyway. That's fine. That's great. Um, what is the one thing you would most like to change about the world? Uh, I, I, I wish there was more. Um, I wish there was more people would notice things more and stop and notice some more of the magic of the world. I think people pass the world by. One of my favorite plays is Thornton Wilder's Our Town. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that, she, you know, she says, why, why are people noticing? I, I think we do that way too much. It's the color purple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> why does God make purple flowers in a meadow? So you yeah. notice them. Yeah. God wants true. to be loved just as we all do. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, okay, last question. It's very frivolous. Um, okay. What TV shows do you watch and binge and love? Oh, wow. Oh, well, I have a kid. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm binging Go Dog Go. And, uh... <laughs> and Bluey. Do you like Bluey? <laughs> I've never seen Bluey, but we've, we've, we've done Daniel Tiger and all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, you know, it's a really good question. I haven't been following anything recently. I was watching with my wife. We'd watch This Is Us um, mm -hmm. at some point, which was really, really good. It was too um, emotional for me. It's really oh, emotional. Yeah. There was not enough Lexapro for me to get through that. Yeah, I just had it, to stop watching it. Yeah, it, it, it was for me as well. It's it's tough. Um, so I haven't really been like religiously watching. But for me, honestly, I am a big Stephen Colbert fan. And, okay. and so for me, it's my ritual to watch Colbert because I find his satire and his mischievous 
intelligence to be just fantastic. And yeah. it, it's sort of the bromide I need given everything that's going on in the yeah. world. So it makes so much sense. That makes so much sense. Well, thank you so much, Michael. This was really enlightening and I, I feel like I want to go write a short story right now. I oh mean... good. Yeah, me too. <laughs> this was delightful, Marcy. I couldn't I couldn't have enjoyed myself more. We I'm we have so to... glad. Excellent. Well, I will be, when I finish your book, I will be in contact because uh, yeah. I'm sure I'm going to have more questions and follow-ups. So. Yeah, no, this was great. This was so much fun. I was The time just flew and I love it. Well, let's be in touch. Keep in yeah, touch. Yeah. Keep me posted on how things are going and uh, I'll, I'll do the same. Awesome. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Permission to Heal. I hope you found it moving and inspirational. Please remember, you don't need anyone else's permission to trust and follow your heart. You have the power within you. Subscribe to Permission to Heal so you don't miss any new episodes, and please share this with your friends.